thank you so much for that wonderful intro and for having me here today. Um, so today I'm going to talk a bit about how genes and the environment might work together um, in autism spectrum disorder and talk a bit about um, neurodevelopment more broadly as well. So in that very nice introduction, Dominique highlighted that I am an epidemiologist. So I study how factors that happen in populations impact health. And that broader sort of public health view is the lens through which we do autism research. Um, so first, I want to start by thanking all of my many collaborators um, across Johns Hopkins and many other institutions and universities that you can see here. Um, in particular, at the top there is Christine Latacosta, who is uh, my co-PI on much of the work that I'll talk about today. Um, Kelly Benke in the middle, who does a lot of our work with genetics and genomics. And at the bottom is Danny Fallon, who has since moved to Emory University. And so the four of us have had made a really core team for autism research here at Hopkins. Um, today, I will talk a bit about the epidemiology of autism and related traits and the effects of environmental exposures on autism, related traits and brain development. So I'll talk a bit about some of the findings that have been replicated across several population-based studies that give us some evidence and some belief that these factors might actually be important. And I'll talk a bit about how genes and the environment work together and address some of the challenges and opportunities for this type of research, thinking about how it can impact broader public health um, and autism from a public health perspective. So first, um, we can say that autism would be broadly defined by perhaps impairments in social communication and social interaction or restricted and repetitive behaviors or interests. Um, there might be different severity levels seen in autism, and I would highlight now that while I might talk about autism or autism spectrum disorder throughout this talk, um, we do indeed recognize that there is a broad perspective and a broad continuum of, of neurodiversity and traits and how um, autism and the way it manifests might impact an individual's life. And so we recognize that um, individuals might have different types of social communication and might need different assistances. Um, there also might be individuals who are more profoundly impaired. And so we recognize that all of these voices and these voices really can be impactful in autism research. So part of why we get interested in autism on a population level is the data from the Center for, Centers for Disease Control Prevention um, operated by the ADAM or the Autism and Developmental Disabilities Monitoring Network indicates that the prevalence of autism has continued to increase over time. So most recently, um, coming from published from the community report in 2021, um, we could find overall that about one in 44 children uh, who are eight years old were identified with autism by the ADAM network. And in particular, more children are being identified early with autism. And in this case, more children are being identified by 48 months of age. Um, so this lets us see that more and more individuals might be impacted by autism. We can see variations across states. We know that methods and access to care are somewhat different. So one of the things that we think about from public health is when the prevalence of something increases in the population, when the prevalence of a trait increases or a disorder increases or a condition increases, what factors might contribute to that? And also, what might we be able to change to, to try to help people um, have healthier and better lives? So when we talk about autism research, um, much of the work of the Simons Foundation of Spark has really thought about genetic variation. And so I said that in the beginning of this talk that I would really talk about the environment today, but I think it is important to begin by talking about genetics. So we know that many neurodevelopmental outcomes, including autism, tend to run in families, and that's this term heritability we see here on this slide that indicates that a proportion of variants are the amount of a particular condition that might be explained by inherited factors. So for autism, that's often estimated to between 50 to 80 percent. So for many neurodevelopmental disorders, that range is quite big and that proportion can be quite high. And when we're talking about genetic variation, we're also talking about many different types of genetic variation. So some of these are things that we can measure through genomic tools that organizations and efforts like Spark really seek to bring on a big level to help us think and understand more about the biology of underlying conditions. One of the simplest ways that we can begin to think about autism and the influence of genetics is by studying families. So many um, papers have seen this. This is a nice example because it has this pretty plot you can see here on this slide where you're looking at the, the probability or the likelihood that an individual might be diagnosed with autism. And what we can see here is that that probability, that likelihood increases if you have a full sibling with an ASD diagnosis. So we can see that autism runs in families is what we might colloquially say, right? It's more likely to have an ASD diagnosis if a person has a sibling with an ASD diagnosis. 
So we know that autism is more common in full siblings, so siblings that share both parents, and that's about a seven to eightfold increase. And we know that male sex and the number of affected siblings are also can make an individual more likely to have an ASD diagnosis. So in this figure here, we can see, for example, that in this population, the proportion of individuals who might have autism um, is increased if they are male and also increased if they have more siblings versus less siblings with autism. So that we can see the difference there between the multiplex or the white bar and the gray bar indicating simplex. One of the things that we like to study too when we're thinking about epidemiology and public health is not just a diagnosis, but also the distribution of a trait. So perhaps there is a particular characteristic that we can study in the population. So things like IQ or the degree of social ability in a person. And those traits can somehow help us think about how these distributions might be shifted in a population. And sometimes that is often really meaningful. What we see in siblings of children with autism and scales on the, that is that um, performance on the Mullen scales of early learning or a scale that measures cognitive development in kids um, often show that sometimes siblings do poor on this test. Similarly, among siblings of children with autism, we often seen that based on the violent adaptive behavior scales, that siblings of children with autism who aren't diagnosed with autism themselves might have more delays or might have heart more difficulties in communication or delivering the daily living skills or socialization measures. So this lets us see that not only perhaps autism runs in families, but perhaps some of the traits we associate with autism might also run in families too. Um, the social responsiveness scale in particular is thought to remember, measure social communication similar to that we see in an ASD diagnosis. And the social responsiveness scale in this case, we also see changing in families. So we can see, for instance, that the, the average social responsiveness scale is increased among siblings with autism. And notably, we know it's not specific to autism. So what we see in this graph on the upper left is that the social responsiveness scale is also increased in um, children, siblings of children who don't have an autism diagnosis, but might have a high functioning language disorder because of the SRS here is really measuring social communication what we can see then, perhaps, right, is that social communication might manifest itself in different ways and different diagnoses within a family. And we can see also here, if you look at the color graphs on the right, where there is a distribution and a shift in this trait in the population. So, for example, in the top two boxes that look at sex based on um, a, gen a sex assigned at birth based on either being a boy or a girl, we can see that the distribution of the SRS score is shifted among children with autism and also among children with a high functioning language disorder. Those distributions of the scale are about overlapping. So that lets us know that children with those diagnoses perform about the same or might have the same amount of difficulty in social communication. And that's different than the children in blue who don't have autism or an, a high functioning language disorder diagnosis. So what's really interesting here is when we think about families, much of our research comes out of these twin and family studies where we study siblings. And we often use this to conclude that genetics matter for autism. One of the things that also could be important in studying twins is that there is a lot of other things that can happen in a family that might be shared across siblings or even within a twin pair. This particular study looked at the distribution of the SRS score, that same trait that I just measured that measures social communication differences among identical twins. And what they looked at was the average score with that's plotted on the graph on the left here across three different populations. So one are families where there are multiple cases of autism with that family. The next one in white was a general population group. And then the yellowish color is data coming from the interactive autism network. So a community-based sample that was recorded online. So we can see that really, if we were to look at the distribution of the SRS score or cross twins from these different types of data sets and these different ways of participating in research, that the relationship or the difference in the score between twins can really be quite different if these children are coming from families where there are multiple autism cases versus not. The plots on the bottom look at the relationship or the correlation, right? How similar are the SRS scores across these identical twins in the family? And what is really interesting to see is that they aren't perfectly correlated. So in this case, studying twins from the same family, in this case, it's identical twins, where we think that on average, they share most of their genes, um, lets us see that perhaps factors that might be responsible for severity of a phenotype or the degree of social impairment in this case, in this data, might be different than those who are responsible for disease occurrence, so from an onset of autism. 
And this provides a target for us when we think about public health interventions and public health perspectives on outcomes to think about the early non-shared environment. What, what could these twins or siblings be experiencing differently in a family and how might that impact their outcomes? So thinking about this from the perspective of ASD diagnosis is one potential outcome for study in autism. I've talked now quite a bit about these developmental quantitative traits. So things like social communication scales that talk about child development and that might be related to autism, but not specifically limited to an autism diagnosis. Um, we can also talk about some of these factors that are in the dark purple box below. So measures that might influence ASD severity. So among individuals with autism, how severe are their impairments? And that's a little bit different than the question up above, which, um, which taps a bit more into the idea of neurodiversity. And we can also think about among people with autism, can we look for factors that influence maybe some of the, the conditions that occur at the same time? So for example, do we wanna study you know, the level of anxiety among a person with autism um, or other mental health conditions? And do we wanna study factors that relate, for example, to physical health? So perhaps the prevalence of obesity among people with autism or sleep problems among people with autism or gastrointestinal conditions. Because for some folks, the fact that we are studying these co-occurring um, conditions or co-occurring relationships might let us really think a bit about how, what, where we could intervene. Perhaps we can help improve a person's sleep and then that might then help improve a person's um, subsequent um, health and quality of life that they experience. So I talked a bit about how studying families lets us also study more broadly and the fact that um, we can study environmental factors. An example, you know, environmental chemicals are one example where many folks have studied how they can impact neurodevelopment over life. You can think about early exposures to neurotoxic chemicals, and that might change downstream developmental programming in an individual. We can think about how genes might function and mature, and we can think about neurological disease, in this case, and changes that might physically happen in the brain because of those chemical exposures. So environmental epidemiology can maybe tell us a lot about neurodevelopment. It can tell us about um, how we measure the environment. So one of the ways that we think about the environment, right, is a possible target for intervention. So we tend to think that anything that could be modified might be the environment. So this would include the chemical and physical environment. So things like pesticides and air pollutants and flame retardants. But we could also think about the social environment. So things that relate to access to care and peer interaction. We can think about lifestyle factors and things that happen to women during pregnancy. And we can also think more broadly about ecosystems. And I'll talk about how we measure these things in the next couple of slides. And part of the reason that we want to study this on a population level is it can tell us how common these environmental factors are and how big of an impact they might have in the population. So, you know, we might have a thing, something in the environment, and we can also think about, you know, environmental chemicals really nicely in this framework where if they happen in a huge way and everyone is exposed to them, right, then they might have a very small impact on the population, but that really matters because that small degree of change could really impact a lot of people. The opposite explanation, right, is you could think about a really cute environmental exposure and environmental disaster that might happen in a very localized area that could then subsequently have a huge impact for that small amount of people. Both of those are really important. And part of the reason we wanna study the environment is it can help us think about mechanisms underlying disorders and conditions, and also help us think about biomarkers. What can we actually measure to understand what's better happening? So in neurodevelopmental disorders, I tend to think about sort of broad buckets of the environments in our research. So the idea of toxicants, so things like air pollution and heavy metals and pesticides that I mentioned. We can think about social factors like socioeconomic status or discrimination. Um, we can use many techniques to look at ecosystems. So this gives us a sense of factors like green space in the environment or um, indices that didn't talk about what kind of quality a neighborhood might have. We can think about maternal medical factors. So things that happen during pregnancy and help characterize that mom. Um, we could, this might include things like infections during pregnancy or how the baby was born or if a mother took a prenatal vitamin. And then we can also think about things that might be a bit more demographic, like mom and dad's age or how closely spaced births are together. So today I'm gonna to highlight some factors that relate to these ones that are sort of red and yellow colored here to give a sense of what our scientific literature has told us and where we think this goes to be working together with genes in autism. So one idea quickly to mention here is how do we measure the environment? 
So we tend to ask people questions. So we'll always have questionnaires that say things like, in the last 12 months, have you experienced? And then you can finish that question by saying, a stressful life situation. Have you put fruit and tick products on your pet? During your pregnancy, did you have? And then you can think about a list of conditions that a mom might be asked during pregnancy. We also ask questions like, does your child have a hard time falling asleep or frequently have abdominal pain? Because these give us sense of, of what we're measuring and what things might impact a person in our population-based studies. We also look at medical records data coming from participants if they give us consent to do so, which helps us think about how we can might quantify some of these things. Um, we also use biomarkers. So in many of our research studies, we might try to collect things like blood or hair or teeth. Um, and many of these are sort of neat and interesting and have been great for participants because they aren't hard to collect. Things like teeth definitely fall into that, um, into that category. But because they also let us, with laboratory technology, actually measure concentrations of things like cortisol that gives us a measure of stress in hair, or perhaps heavy metal concentration that we can be measuring teeth. Um, and then oftentimes we use geographic linkages. So based on an individual's address, we can get an estimate of air pollution exposure outside their house or the quality of their neighborhood is measured by census indicators. And so these are all pretty powerful measures when we think about population. So I talked a bit about different buckets of environmental exposures and now I'm just going to review some of the literature on some of these specific things. Um, so the first and where much of my research has been is that on air pollution and neurodevelopment. Um, so many studies have looked at this relationship in regard to neurodevelopmental outcomes and disorders. Um, and broadly, what we can see is that neurodevelopment and it seems to be impacted by air pollution exposure that happens during the prenatal period in early life. Specific to autism, there have been 23 papers as of 2016, so this number has increased markedly over the last five or six years. Um, that have looked at the relationship between air pollution and autism that broadly conclude that outdoor air quality in a neighborhood based on an individual's address, often around the time of birth, does seem to be associated with autism. Um, and in particular, more recent papers, and this one coming from the study to explore, explore early development or the SEED study, which is a population-based case control or study or, or study that compares children with autism to children who are typically developing across the United States, um, looked at the violent adaptive behavior scales. So one of those mentioned such the scales I mentioned earlier that looks at how kids function in daily life and found that even among kids with autism, children who lived in more polluted areas, and in particular in their first year of life, were more likely to have more problems with daily life and communication, in particular overall functioning, as well as in regard to their daily living skills or socialization abilities. So this is really interesting, right? Because this gives us an idea of how an environmental contaminant might impact just how a person does, with their a person with a particular condition does and functions. Um, and this lets us think that perhaps, you know, better air quality and more a better neighborhood maybe can help improve that person and help improve some of the impacts that they might have in their life. I mentioned earlier, too, that one of the sort of sorts of exposures that we look at, right, might fall into the prenatal exposure and also into maternal medical factors sort of bucket. So here we can see um, in this particular study coming from the Boston Birth Cohort, um, which is a fairly large study of autism and neurodevelopmental outcomes nested in Boston Medical Center. Um, they've looked at the relationship between infection and fever during pregnancy in particular in relationship to ASD. And overall find that fever during pregnancy and in particular late pregnancy might increase the likelihood that a child has an ASD diagnosis. What's interesting in these epidemiologic studies of ours and the BBC data there is one example, is one of the things that we try to do is look for consistency in these relationships across multiple studies and diagnoses. So here you can see, for example, that the current study is included in this picture that shows our measures of association, right, or the impact of fever, for example, during pregnancy in the context of other data sets. So what we're looking for here specifically is where our estimates of association, those black boxes, right, in the middle of those estimates, are all going the same direction in this data. And that directionality and that consistency is one of the things that we see now when we think on a population level, oh, wow, fever during pregnancy, and in particular late pregnancy, might be important. Can we look at this in additional studies? So that's exactly then what was subsequently done. So then researchers looked at the data coming off of that Brucato paper, which is now a few years old, and more recently looked at a meta-analysis or a way of harmonizing 
what that measure of association is, what that relationship is between infection and fever during pregnancy across 36 studies from around the world. And they overall do say and conclude that it looks like fever during pregnancy might have an impact on increasing the likelihood that a child might be diagnosed with autism later in life. So this consistency is part of what we want to see across populations, because every study measures these things a little bit differently. And that's one of the things that we as epidemiologists are always trying to understand is where are these similarities and differences coming from? Um, another example of um, a place where behavior and medicine might come together in autism research um, is thinking about folate and multivitamins in autism. So folate is interesting and it's a bit different than talking about things like air pollution or infection or fever. So the reason I'm really interested in folate in regard to neurodevelopmental outcomes is because we have fortification, for example, in the United States. The reason this exists is because folate helps prevent neural tube defects. So we know that folate is actually really important in early stages of brain development during pregnancy to make sure that everything grows correctly and connects correctly and it's fully formed in a baby. Many studies now, including studies where fortification isn't necessarily present, have looked in particular at folic acid taken right before um, a mother becomes pregnant or during her pregnancy could actually help prevent um, the occurrence of autism. So this particular study here is from Israel. It's huge. So you can see it's over 45,000 individuals and over 500 cases of autism were included in this particular study. Um, and what they find overall, right, is that folic acid supplements or multivitamin supplements taken before pregnancy or during pregnancy look like they actually decrease the likelihood that a child might be diagnosed with autism. Other studies um, like the Boston birth cohort data I mentioned earlier, have actually measured plasma folate in a mom. So they've had a mom blood sample taken when they enrolled in the study because moms agreed to do so and actually could measure folate in that blood sample. So this is a little bit better than coming from medical record and saying, did this mom report taking a vitamin or not, right? We're actually looking at a biological dose here. And what they found in the Boston birth cohort study was that lower level or higher levels of folate, so beyond sort of a, an optimal range, might actually increase the likelihood that a child had ASD. So there's a little bit of a different story here in terms of how we might measure this. But overall, it seems like folate and prenatal vitamins would be healthy. We want to make sure, though, that we're doing this in the situation in the way right, that we are properly communicating this, these factors to moms. Um, another study, for example, that has looked at, at folate and prenatal vitamin intake, for example, in autism, um, particularly followed in a very special population, siblings of mothers who have, or sorry, younger siblings of children with autism. So these are moms enrolled in this population called the Markers of Autism Risk in Babies Learning Early Signs, or MARBLE study. So these MARBLE's moms have had a child with autism, and then when the mom is pregnant, she enrolls in this research study. So here this lets us prospectively see, so following a mom forward through her pregnancy over time, and then following that infant prospectively till they're about three years of age, what the relationship here might be between moms who said that they took a prenatal vitamin supplement and the relationship with that child's autism diagnosis. And here what we see is that um, in particular, moms who took a prenatal vitamin supplement those three months before pregnancy, so those months before they conceived, we're less likely to have a child with autism. This is even more interesting since these moms have already had a child with autism. So that baby they were pregnant with was about seven to eight times more likely to have autism and about 50 to 60% of the time they might have another neurodevelopmental disorder. So this is the sort of a behavioral and medical factor that we could think about perhaps in a particular group of moms might be really beneficial um, to help them have a healthy pregnancy and a healthy outcome. Um, one other idea or one other example here um, is maternal antidepressant use in pregnancy, and particularly I mentioned this one as it relates to maternal mental health itself. Um, so this very large study here that was published in the New, Journal, New England Journal of Medicine um, attempted to examine the relationship between selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, for example, and autism. Um, and overall, what they found was that moms who took SSRIs um, looked like they had an increased likelihood of having a child with an autism diagnosis. But this paper in particular didn't do a very important thing. It didn't look at the role of mom maternal health, mental health itself. In subsequent papers, like this one here that was just published in this last year, um, does so. And more importantly, what they find 
is that it looks like mom's history of a mental health disorder. So whether a mom had a diagnosis of anxiety or an eating disorder, an overall mental health condition was more important than whether or not perhaps they took an SSRI or another pharmaceutical. And in particular, what we see here, right, is that um, in this paper, we can see that moms with a history of anxiety disorder and eating disorder were more likely in this data set to have a child with autism. And moms with a history of any psychiatric condition, anxiety or depression, were more likely to have a child with a developmental delay. What's more important and what gives us a very important piece of information is to then examine in this data set, amongst moms um, who had a psychiatric disorder now, but we know that that is important. Did they take an SSRI or not? And here's where we don't find any significant relationships with either autism or developmental delay. Part of the reason we wanna do this, right, is we would never wanna take away a medication from a mother who might need it um, to be able to have a healthy pregnancy and a healthy life. And so, you know, this literature around, for example, pharmaceuticals and here SSRIs, it was really important to think about what is the reason that you might be prescribed that pharmaceutical? And is that potentially what is, um, what is interesting there? Part of what we think might underlie these relationships is the fact that many genetic studies um, have shown us that there is an inherited liability or an inherited shared um, amount of genetics across all psychiatric conditions. So of course we see these relationships. Um, that's part of how they work, right? Um, one of the other things that we like to think about in epidemiology are interactions across exposures. And so I'm going to give you a couple quick examples here of how some of these factors that I just talked about individually might work together. So I can say broadly that there have been five studies of how the diet and the environment might work together in relationship to autism. So there is some idea out there in the world, and there is some nice scientific evidence around this, for example, that perhaps moms who take a prenatal vitamin and moms who might live in an area where they might be exposed to higher levels of air pollution or pesticides, um, those two factors might work against each other, right? They might, so maybe, you know, maybe if you do take your prenatal vitamin, even if you live in an area with poor air quality, um, that could help protect your child um, subsequently in your pregnancy. And so more research needs to be done here, but these are some of the things that we're thinking about now as we move forward. We're also thinking about how chemical factors and social factors might work together. So there've been a couple of really interesting studies out there in general describing in the United States, for example, how air quality might vary by race and ethnicity and poverty, in particular urbanicity in the U.S. population. Um, and one study has looked at actually the relationship between air pollution um, and the quality of a neighborhood in relationship to the odds of an ASD diagnosis. Um, and so more and more, we're trying to think about how these factors occur together, because one of the things that we realize is that it's impossible in an individual person, if we want to think about translating from populations and science to people, right, um, the fact that all these things all occur at the same time. So how can we also begin to use that idea to study it in the population? And that's part of why we really think it's important here at Hopkins um, and have really championed the idea of studying how genes and the environment work together. So we can think about how these factors can pool together to perhaps change autism. So one of the interesting things that I mentioned earlier, right, is there are lots of different types of genetics and different ways we can study genetics. And it gets harder and harder to study how genes and the environment work together if they both become more rare, where in the population, if they're both common, it's a lot easier. And so one of the things that we need here are bigger and bigger studies um, in which to do this work. So right now, gene-environment interaction is a fairly understudied area in autism research. Um, we're really hoping to change that. There are about 12 studies out there in the whole world that have published on genes and environment together in autism. They looked at many types of different genetic factors. They've looked at a whole range of environmental factors. And highlighting some of these environmental factors that I just described, um, I can also show you how examples of what we have are those 12 studies of how genes and the environment work together. So one first example here um, has to do with um, folic acid intake and a particular gene called MTHFR. So the reason MTHFR is interesting is moms who have a slow metabolizing version of this gene in particular are often diagnosed with a folic acid disorder. And if you have this genotype, which can be tested in a clinical setting, um, what, your, what your healthcare provider might do is prescribe to you a more active form of folic acid as opposed to one you might buy off the shelf um, at the pharmacy um, for, in your prenatal vitamin. So the reason for this is because moms with a particular type of this genotype 
their body just inherently doesn't metabolize folic acid as well as other people's do. Um, and so what this paper did was looked both at mom and child genotype of maternal folic or this MTHFR gene and whether or not mom had taken um, enough folate or had enough folic acid intake during pregnancy. So overall, what they found was that moms who had the better or faster metabolizing version of this gene and who had taken enough prenatal folic acid during pregnancy had the least likelihood of having a child diagnosed with autism. Um, but what was interesting, right, is that child and mom genotype did seem to matter. So for example, we can see that these factors really work together. Um, other studies, for example, have looked at a gene called MET, so the MET receptor tyrosine kinase gene, in relationship to air pollution exposure. So part of why this one was picked with air pollution work is that there was a nice mouse study that showed that um, mice who were exposed to air pollutants in a model system had less of this protein expressed in their brains. So the nice part about this gene in people, right, is it's been associated with autism in previous studies, and we could easily measure it in individuals, and found overall that people who had the variation version of the gene that produced less MET and were exposed to air pollution were more likely to have an autism diagnosis compared to those who in either of the groups or exposed to neither of them. So this is another example of gene environment interaction, right, how biology might work together. However, as genetics grew and our populations have gotten in bigger, we've looked at different types of genetics as opposed to how the function of just one particular gene works. So this idea of copy number burden or the amount of repeats in an individual's genome, right, um, it, across the genome, right, is one of the other ways that we have studied gene environment interaction. We've looked at this measure in relationship to air pollution exposure. It's been examined in relationship to maternal infection, driven by um, a lot of the literature I showed you earlier and the fact that infection was been associated and fever was associated with pregnancy. Um, and finally, is another example of a different type of genetic variation that's been incorporated into these studies um, is the idea of gene disrupting mutations. So versions of a gene where um, regions of the gene don't work the way they should and the gene doesn't function properly. And that has been examined along jointly with um, antidepressant use, for example. The reason these exposures were all picked in many of these studies is because they showed initially some evidence of an association or relationship with autism. So what's the goal for these gene environment interactions? Why would we be studying them? Are we trying to look at new genes or maybe we can use genes to help us find new environments that we should be studying that we don't see unless they're operating on a particular genetic background? Also, do we try to study these things independently or jointly? Are we trying to get at a measure of some way in our research studies of what happens in families so that then we can better see the impact of a particular environment? Or maybe we want to see them together. And one of the things I'll point out here is our sample size has to get bigger and bigger as we try to examine these things that might be more and more rare combinations. So this tool is called a GWAS or a genome-wide association study. Um, anybody participating in SPARC has probably heard about this, and GWAS is one of our many tools in, in genetic epidemiology, is to look systematically across an individual's whole genome for a single change in the genome. And we're going to do this in a way that isn't biased initially by biology. So what we're going to do is measure the same spots in the genome and, you know, perhaps up to 500,000 or a million spots in the genome in relationship to neurodevelopmental disorders. And what we're looking at here statistically is to try to find locations in the genome where it looks like they might be associated with a particular outcome. So in regard to neurodevelopment, and we've done these genome-wide studies for things like general cognitive function and for particular things related to executive function and ADHD and autism. And in autism in particular, we've done better and better at looking how genes might be associated with ASD as we move forward and as our samples have gotten bigger and bigger. Um, so Kelly Benke here on our team has done a lot of work, at least on our, in our, for our group, trying to think about how to go from looking at, you know, millions of places, in this case, over 9 million places in the genome, in our studies, when, you know, there are 18,000 cases of autism, you can maybe look at 9 million spots in the genome. But if we have a couple hundred people in our study with a lot of data on what happened during their pregnancy and what chemicals are in their home, we can't look at 9 million places in the genome. We need to try and help summarize this information. And that's often summarized by something called a polygenic score or PGS. So what Kelly has done in our work um, is work to sort of implement um, a way that analytically we can take 9 million tests in the genome and summarize it into one, one variable that's included in our analysis. 
And then we include that variable in our analysis moving forward when we want to try to summarize um, the proportion of variation explained by genetics. So in autism, this hasn't been done as much. In other disorders, um, and this is an example of a paper here coming from schizophrenia that looked at complications, obstetric complications during pregnancy and schizophrenia, they have already done that with great success. And look to see, for example, how this summary measure of, of variation that can comes from genes, um, as well as obstetric complications, really works together um, to increase the likelihood that an individual might have schizophrenia. One of the other things that's really interesting, too, when we think about these summary genetic scores is that in Alzheimer's disease, they've actually been able to get at prediction, and in this case, prediction of progression. So, for example, how, how an individual's polygenic score for autism might be associated with late onset or early onset of Alzheimer's disease, or perhaps they have more cognitive dysfunction and higher amyloid load. And so this is really important because perhaps these summary measures can let us get at severity um, or let us better characterize a, a trait like social communication across the whole spectrum of neurodiversity. And that's really interesting in a different perspective than what we've been seeing a lot of times when we're just looking for genes associated with risk or initial associations. So in a lot of our studies, we often work with these longitudinal sibling cohorts. So again, younger siblings are followed over time who have an older or a sibling with autism, an older sibling with autism. Um, we've worked with many consortia across these studies and are currently working as part of um, an initiative called the ECHO that's supported by the National Institute of um, Health um, to follow these individuals up over time. So what's cool here is it lets us begin to get a bigger and bigger sample size for the study of how these polygenic scores for autism might actually relate then to subsequent case control status and subsequent trait. Right. So one of the things I want to point out here is that in, in these individual studies, for example, we might only have 30 or 60 individuals with autism. And it's when we can begin to pull across these studies that we begin to have significant power. So I mentioned power and having gene environment interaction and measures together. Um, and the SPARC initiative um, by the Simons Foundation has been a huge pioneer in thinking about this in terms of genetic and phenotypic data available. Um, one of the cool parts about SPARC when we have been fortunate to collaborate with um, is to think about the research match initiative in SPARC. Um, and so we have had a study that has been ongoing now for several years called the Genes and Environment and Autism Research Study or the GEARS Research Study. Um, and mothers from SPARC were contacted to participate in this. I think we were either the first or second initial research match initiative and for SPARC, which is really fun to be able to say and also to be able to show you today some of the data that has come out of this work. Um, so initially, children enrolled in SPARC were between 2 and 12 years old um, because we asked their moms to then report on things that happened during pregnancy. Um, and so the moms were given a custom 30-item GEARS questionnaire following consent to be included in the study, um, and they completed the questionnaire online. And we asked all sorts of questions because we're trying to do this um, in the SPARC framework, things that were like, before your pregnancy with your child, did you have any of the following conditions? And then you could think about a whole chart where a mom could check, I was diagnosed with diabetes and I had asthma and I had anxiety, for example so that we can try to get a broad range of things that might characterize that mom's pregnancy. We also ask questions like, during the three months before you came pregnant, did you take a prenatal vitamin? Because we've seen that that's been important in autism as well, and we know that that's broadly important for neurodevelopment. And then we can connect these environmental exposures with measures of the outcomes that already exist in SPARC. And in particular, I'll show you some examples now coming from the social communication questionnaire, the SCQ that everyone in SPARC completes. Um, so Luke Grosner, who is a doctoral student here at Hopkins, has really led this work, and it comes from some of the preliminary work for his dissertation that he'll defend this spring. Um, and so what we can see so far coming from Spark and from our GEARS data is that about 2,200 moms have completed the questionnaire where we've been able to connect genetic and exposure data. So our sample sizes to do this work are getting bigger and bigger, which is so incredibly powerful. Um, and we can see overall, for example, that many of the children enrolled in the study so far um, were had male sex assigned at birth, um, and uh, many of them were diagnosed for autism around the age of four. Um, we can also see, for example, that we can look at the distribution of SCQ scores, so the social communication scale scores and the SPARC kids. And this is an example from about 1,600 kids. Um, based on the established cutoffs for the SCQ, we have colored this graph. Um, 
uh, relative to clinical um, implications. So where a score of 15 or higher is often seen to be consistent in terms of screening with analysis and diagnosis. So you can see that differentiation here. And the average score in the SPARC sample um, is dedicated by that vertical dashed line. So it's about 21. So definitely a little bit higher than what we would see um, in terms of a, a negative screening score. So this is awesome, right? This lets us see in a large sample of kids um, with autism what their social communication level might be. Um, so one of the neat things that we've done moving forward is looked among these children with autism. What is just the relationship then of the autism polygenic score that I talked about how it was built earlier and many of these environmental factors that we ask about in the GEARS questionnaire. So you can see here, for example, that um, about 19% of the moms in the study so far reported that they had had a diagnosis of asthma um, ever in their life, or about 40% had a diagnosis of major depressive disorder. What this picture tells us here, then, is the relationship between the autism polygenic score and that environment. So um, amongst those kids with autism, because one of the things that we're trying to look for is how genes in the environment might be correlated or working together in this case. And that lets us start to think about how gene environment interaction might work. One of the next steps then that we implement is to say, so then how does this autism polygenic score work together with a particular exposure? So here, for example, one example are moms who reported fever during pregnancy. And we can see here that is the solid red line in the graph below. And the dashed line then are moms who did not report fever during pregnancy. So when these lines cross, one of the things that we want to see here, and one of these things that really is interesting, is that that is evidence statistically of an interaction. So we can see, for example, that moms who had um, moms with a fever, for example, were more likely to have a lower polygenic load for autism than moms who didn't. So this lets us see how these factors might be working together differently. We can also look at mom mental illness again, where we can see the same relationship in hand. Um, for example, though, we might look at a different phenotype. So in this case, it's the stereotype behavior scale of the SCQ. And here we're looking at the relationship between mom prenatal vitamin report in the solid red line versus mom who didn't report taking a prenatal vitamin during pregnancy in the dashed red line. And what's interesting here, right, is that our polygenic score for autism, as moms have higher power, as kids had a higher polygenic load for autism, um, that the likelihood of that autism diagnosis increased even more so among moms who didn't take that prenatal vitamin. So this lets us see how some of these relationships might work together. And as one more example, we've done a comparable analysis looking at moms who reported smoking during pregnancy um, and ASD polygenic score in relationship to autism diagnosis. So what we're trying to understand here is, are these interactions, do they really seem to be real? Do they really seem to change an individual's path? And how might they impact, for example, here, degree of stereotype behaviors among autism? So this is a bit different perspective. And one of the things that we've been able to really do now working with Spark is to think about exploring a different, um, different types of genetic variation and different types of environments. Um, we want to be able to think more and more about um, how these exposures might be measured and whether or not we think our reporting is consistent. We can think about different types of genomics and we wanna think a lot about some of these impacts and analyses that might come into play. So some of this is operational, but you know, working with Spark has really been foundational for us in thinking about how to scale up this research. And I know that in terms of genetic discovery, that's one of the goals of Spark. Um, for us, we really think about gene environment interaction and we're lucky to recently be funded um, through the Autism Centers of Excellence Network Initiative um, to build on the GEARS network. So we had our original Spark GEARS, which has now spawned a larger network. It's really exciting. Um, um, we have 18 sites that have worked together of over 175,000 individuals to really gain this large scale population perspective of how genes and environment work right together. And what we want to think about is how different kinds of genes and different kinds of environment, as I talked about today, might impact this broad range of potential outcomes in autism. So not only to study diagnosis, or perhaps, but also to think about um, how they might impact in traits that are brought across many neurodiverse perspectives, how genes and environment might work together to, to inform severity or impairment or degree of cognitive ability. And then also to think about if we can actually get some traction around physical health. You know, can we come up with combinations of genes and environment perhaps that might be really impactful for individuals with autism who also have sleep problems? And what then can we do about that to help improve quality of life?
Um, one of the other things that we like to do is to talk to our friends who do laboratory models. Um, so they are also going to work in some experimental systems and cellular models to help us replicate and study particular types of genes in the environment. Um, and in particular, the next steps that we try to see in our epidemiologic analysis, as you can see here in this table, are going to try to address both con physical contaminants in the environment, like air pollutants, but also things that we can also intervene on a more individual level. So things like maternal infection during pregnancy or folic acid in relationship to many outcomes. But one of the things that we're very current are very um, cognizant of, right, is to think about how we would talk about this to folks with autism and their families and who our target audience for this work might be. You know, we're not looking to um, rid autism or, or, or perhaps not recognize that people with many neurodiverse perspectives really still are important. But can we better understand and perhaps improve individuals' quality of life? Um, thinking about how perhaps um, genes and environment might work together for healthcare providers or women planning a pregnancy or people um, with autism or with neurodiverse perspectives who might have particular other physical health challenges. Um, and so we have convened a community advisory board and we are really working to try to think about how we're going to work to translate much of this work moving forward. Because ultimately, we want to think about intervention and prevention um, from the perspective of disorder severity and trait measures. So can we help, um, help address and help improve perhaps quality of life for some severity measures or some trait measures? Can we address co-occurrence of physical health conditions? And can we think about many types of exposures in different populations that might be working together? Um, you know, thinking about the broad range of exposures and how they might work together on a population level, and also thinking about diversity of exposures, both neurodiversity as well, um, really perhaps can help us more collaboratively and more comprehensively address and improve health um, and address many health challenges that individuals might experience. Um, and so with that, I would like to thank you so much for your time today. I hope I have been both educational and informative and entertaining, um, and also recognize the many organizations that have helped fund our research. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Volk, and thanks to everyone that's you know, submitted questions so far. Please, uh, you can continue to submit questions in the Q&A box as we kick off the Q&A. We have a few minutes for that now. So uh, one question that came in from a handful of people actually was, um, how are you factoring socioeconomic status into these different pollutant exposure, um, into these different studies? So that is a fantastic question. Um, so in many of our early studies, we have specifically asked mom um, questions around um, level of education attained by both her and other adults that might be in the home to let us think about um, socioeconomic status. We also recognize that it's potentially a much bigger question. And so now, in addition to that sort of work, we also try to look at in our same analyses um, how uh, neighborhood measures and how neighborhood socioeconomic status and input might impact um, air pollution exposure levels. Um, we're really interested in particular in trying to get a sense of neighborhood deprivation measures and how that might relate to environmental exposures um, and thinking about how access to care. So as a person traveling really far to find access to a clinician, for example, um, also relates to that. And so we include all those sorts of variables now in our analyses to try to better understand that relationship. Great. And then um, specifically looking at the air pollution studies. Um, I, I think you sort of answered part of this question about the socioeconomic piece, but can you talk a little bit about um, how location plays a, played a factor in that at all? Definitely. So with regard to air pollution, um, physical geographic location is one of the tools that we have to try to look at air pollution exposure. Um, so basically, based on an address, um, we can assign the latitude and longitude much like you can based on the GPS in your car that might be on your phone to help you give directions. Um, and we can connect that to um, data that lets us see and monitor the air quality across the United States. So physical location in that way is one of the ways that we look at that exposure. Um, one of the other things that we try to do in regard to physical location is also look at urbanicity. Does a person live in an urban or rural environment, for example, or how densely populated is the area that they might be in? And those are some physical factors that we look at as well. There's increasingly a lot of interest about green space. 
um, which I think is really interesting, especially as we think about more urban environments. Um, and how that relates to air pollution exposure is a, is a question I think for the future that we'll need to be looking at better. Uh, awesome. And then switching gears to uh, more diet and gastrointestinal issues, if you're able to speak to that. Uh, we had a question, how are dietary recommendations and or gastrointestinal issues, um, how do those correlate with genes in autism? So that is a great question. Um, so many of these genome-wide association study tools have been to apply to um, gastrointestinal disorders. Um, and so there have been studies out there, right, that have looked to find genes that relate specifically to GI conditions and mostly diagnoses. Um, we have a paper that is currently in press um, that is actually trying to look at um, maternal reported conditions in their child, and in particular, more things like constipation or bloating or cramping. So some of the more um, conditions or symptoms, right, that a child might have that aren't actually a diagnosis in relationship to some of the genes that have been seen to re relate to those, to those diagnoses. Um, one of the real questions that I think we have is, you know, are we looking at genetics that really contribute to this sort of diagnosis or, or is this somehow perhaps a, a behavior that we might see um, associated with people with autism because of, you know, dietary restrictions or preferences around food. And so we're trying to understand how much might be behavior and how much really might be genetic. Um, and then looking back to the, uh, the pre-pregnancy vitamin intake study, uh, mm -hmm. were these moms randomly assigned to their intake groups or were they more, or did you find they're more likely to take vitamins due to other factors such as their education, um, or their income perhaps? Great question. So those moms, it was not a randomized intervention. So those were moms just from a population study that reported whether or not they had taken, um, fully during their pregnancy or not. And many of the studies that I described were conducted in that vein. Um, and so uh, overall, I think that's a really great question. One of the one of the things that we're trying to better understand now is that um, is there something specific about moms who do or don't use a prenatal vitamin or decide to take them? And one of the questions around is, you know, if a mom a woman is planning a pregnancy versus not, she might be more likely to take that prenatal vitamin. Um, and there are many things that could happen in a person's life that would relate to that. So um, I guess that's a that's a TBD in terms of having a great answer there. <laughs> Um, okay. And then one sort of a, a related question to the, the pregnancy piece, but also circling back to the location, um, are historical addresses considered? So for instance, if somebody, uh, you know, where they live now differs from the place where they, uh, conceived, is that considered in, in these studies as well? It is, and it's one of the really important pieces of information we try to ask. So oftentimes in these forums, we'll ask a mom, so where did you live when your child was born? And do you still live there? And if you don't live, and if you, so if you live someplace different now, where do you live now? And if you live someplace different while you were pregnant, right, or early in your pregnancy or pre-pregnancy, we ask for those addresses too, because what we want to do, right, is to be able to use that address data to let us sort of reconstruct relative to time what those exposures might have been. Awesome. And then one last question, and I think this is a really great, just general clarifying question yeah. that other people on the call may have besides just, you know, the, who, who asked this. So um, again, just to clarify, is it possible that genes that are at certain, that are at risk for certain conditions may or may not be expressed based on certain environmental conditions or exposures? Exactly. Um, and that is really, you know, fundamentally what we're trying to get at when we're talking about gene environment interaction. Um, you know, the idea is that there could be a certain genetic liability that exists for any different condition, but we might not see it actually working or happening unless a particular environment is in place. Um, and we hope that by studying these things together, that lets us better understand um, a particular disorder. Uh, 